the National Broadcasting Company presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. United States counter spies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. These counter-spy reports to the American people are brought to you each week at this time. Now, the case of the stolen secret. Dr. Hilton, I wish you'd let me go with you. It's best that I go alone, Lucy. After you leave me off at the railroad station, I'd like you to go back home and wait until you hear from me. Just as you say. But somehow I don't like the idea of you going to Washington by yourself. I'll attract much less attention that way. That formula in your briefcase is so important, you can never tell now what my... Now, come, ha- come, Lucy. You're getting all upset over nothing at all. You've worked two long years on it. I've watched you, Dr. Hilton. I know how much it's taken out of you. It was worth every minute of it, my dear. I know, but I can't help thinking of the desperate measures certain people might take to gain possession of it. At the present moment, my dear Lucy, that would be a sheer waste of time. Only this week, I discovered certain of my hypotheses were invalid. Fortunately, I know now the cause of my errors. Nevertheless, my formula will still be in the hands of the National Defense Coordinator in the morning. Oh, you say it so lightly, as though your very life weren't in danger. (laughs) Lucy, I'm not the swaggering hero you'd like to think I am. I think you're pretty wonderful. Do you mind? Not at all. I'm flattered. You've been like a father to me. Yes, unfortunately, I'm at the age where I best suit the fatherly role. Is this close enough to the platform? Fine, my dear, fine. Dr. Hilton, I still can't help worrying. Won't you please let me go with you? I brought along my overnight bag. Please say yes. Lucy, believe me, I assure you that nothing very much can happen to me or the formula. But... But how can you be so sure? Because until I make certain revisions in my figures, my formula will be of no consequence. Several hours work in my train compartment at most. Until then, what I'm carrying in my briefcase is worthless. Are you sure you're not telling me a story? My word of honor. Now do you feel better about it? Much. But you will be careful anyway. Now promise me. I promise, my dear, not to run afoul of any cloak and dagger tactics between now and my arrival in Washington. Well, there's my train coming in. I'll be back in Centerdale Tuesday. Goodbye, Lucy. Goodbye, Doctor. And don't worry. Everything will be perfectly all right. Perfectly. Who is it? Conductor, sir. No, just a moment. One peep out of you, Hilton, and you're dead. What? Inside. Uh, what's the meaning of this? All right, sit down. Uh, you'll be good or a bullet goes through your head. Uh, what do you want? You know what I want. And it won't have to be a mess if you hand it over. I, I don't know what you're talking about. If it's money you're after... Yeah, I... it's money I'm after. Not the kind you'd be carrying. Well, maybe this has what I want. Give me that briefcase. Ah, thanks for telling me it's in here. Give me that. I told you to sit down. Uh, please, you must right, not let go. Take okay, you asked for it. Jennison, Centerdale County Spy Field Office, to David Harding, Washington. Dr. Theodore Hilton found murdered aboard train en route Washington. Train being held at this stop for thorough investigation. 
We'll stand by for any special orders from you. Jennison's supplementary report, Peters. Came in over the counter spy wire three minutes ago. Dr. Theodore Hilton. I've heard that name, Mr. Harding. Dr. Hilton was a research scientist. Oh, yes. In the field of fuel refining, right? Right. He just completed developing a new formula for processing a special fuel for jets. It was to have given us a sure edge on air power. Dr. Hilton was on his way to Washington here to explain the process to government technicians. It isn't hard to fill in the rest, Chief. The formula's missing. Yes. But we do know that it was being carried in a tan leather briefcase, locked. The case was missing from his train compartment. Any other leads? No. Still too early to determine what sort of instrument struck the blow that killed Dr. Hilton. Did anyone see Hilton with another person on the train? We don't know yet. All the passengers are being questioned. The thing is to find out what happened to that briefcase, hmm? Yes, and the espionage agent who took it. I've already sent out orders to put every available man on this case. All roads, train stations, bus depots, and airports in that area are now under our surveillance. What do we do now, Dave? Now, Peters, we're taking the jet to Meadville to supervise operations. Okay, coming up, a ham on rye. Two coffee. Cigarettes. Hey? Eh? Yeah, what kind? What do I care? Any kind. Okay, here you are. i get you some matches. Uh, keep. Good night. Hey, wait a minute. Operator. Quick, operator, uh, get me the uh, counter spy field office here in town. Right away, sir. Senderdale, Countess Spy, Field Office, Agent Jennison. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, this is Cy Smith, Smitty's Diner on Elm Street. Yes? Uh, look, uh, a guy just walked out of here carrying a briefcase that looked like the one I heard about on the radio, the one that Dr. Hilton had when he was killed. He just walked out? Yeah. Did you watch where he went? Uh, yeah, he, he hopped into a car out front. It looked to me like it was a Chevy. Could you describe what he looked like? Sure. He left a half a buck for a pack of smokes. Who'd forget a guy like that? in Jet S-1 en route Meadville. Harding, go ahead, Jennison. Continuing report on the diner operator. He's given us a pretty clear picture of the man with the briefcase, but he was unable to make identification from our local photo files. All right, Jennison, contact our statistical department in Washington. Tell them to have everything prepared for an identification search. Then have that diner operator flown to Washington as soon as possible. You got that? Yes, Mr. Harding, I'll get right on it. you, Karoka. I've been trying to get you on the phone for a couple of hours. Steve, I do not sit in this hole in the wall developing pictures every minute of my life. I go out to eat sometimes. Not often, but every once in a while. Yeah, you take three hours to eat me, I walk around with those hot papers on me, right out in the open. I'm where... not interested in your tale of woe. Garok has his own. I stand in a dark room till the sight of the sunlight blinds me. I am not better than a donkey used in the mines. Yeah, you and your talk. At least I do my job well. There was nothing about killing Dr. Hilton in the instructions given to you by Mr. Sibley. Well, I couldn't help it. The old guy got too rough for his own good. 
Mr. Sibley will not be happy about that. But who's asking you what Mr. Sibley will be happy about? Here's the stuff. Put it on microfilm and shut your mouth. The likes of you, Garok, does not take orders from. Garok is an artist. Garok is nothing but a big mouth. Now, come on, take the papers and do what you're supposed to do. I am to do nothing until Mr. Sibley arrives. Garok is wise enough to follow instructions. You sure put on a big front, don't you, Garok? I do the dirty work. Very and... dirty work. I'm telling you, Garok, I'm not taking much more of you. You cannot frighten me, Steve. Garok has brains. Yeah, well, and I... And Garok also has a gun in his pocket. Ah, Mr. Sibley. Good evening, Mr. Sibley. I see we're all assembled. Good. He just got here. Yes. Steve. Hello, Mr. Sibley. It would be more appropriate to make that goodbye, my friend. What? You needn't become alarmed. As yet, I haven't decided under what circumstances we shall part. I'm convinced only of the necessity of ending our relationship. Now, look, Mr. Sibley, I got what you were after. Control yourself. Yes, Steve, do. There's no need for becoming upset. A drink, Mr. Sibley? Not at the moment, Garok, thank you. Here's the papers, Mr. Sibley. Maybe we don't click too good together, but anyway, here's what you were after. So if it's okay with you, I'll take my pay off now and beat it. To simple minds, everything seems so uncomplicated. Sit down, Steve. I have some things to say to you before you leave. I'll stand. As you wish. Briefly, my friend, you've gone about your assignment in a fashion so slovenly that I find it absolutely incredible. You mean about what happened to Dr. Hilton? What else could I possibly mean? Well, I couldn't help that. It was an accident. I didn't think that slug on the head would kill him on. It's just an accident, Mr. Sibley. That's unimportant now. The man is dead, and the formula is of almost no use to us because of that fact. Without Dr. Hilton, it'll take much too long to make practical application of those papers you think so valuable. That is why Garok did not put them on microfilm. So the operation itself is a failure. But added to that, you've allowed yourself to become identified. What do you mean? Nobody saw me. No. The description of your unhappy countenance has been advertised on every radio station in the country. But I'm telling Why you... Why didn't you get rid of that briefcase, you embassy? I did get rid of it. I threw it in an empty lot. But not until after you were seen with it. Well, I couldn't help it. It had a lock on it. I had to break the lock, didn't I? I Quiet. Had... The point is, you're very dangerous to us at the moment, to our entire network. And most important of all, to my superior. Why, I thought you were running the operation. Garok. Yes, Mr. Sibley. I shall leave the matter of Steve's disposition up to you. And I, Mr. Sibley, will leave it up to this gun. Hey, wait, For wait. Garok, this will be an exquisite pleasure. I shall wait here until you return. Where is the liquor? In the chest over there. I have some very fine brandy. Now, Mr. Sibley, give me a break. I do enjoy fine brandy. So much. Goodbye, Steve. Yes? Miss Lucy Braden? Yes? I'm David Harding, Miss Braden. This is my assistant, Mr. Peters. We drove over from Meadville to speak with you. Oh, Please come in, gentlemen. Thank you. This way. We, we can talk in the living room. All right. You've been with Dr. Hilton for a number of years, we understand. Yes, Mr. Peters. I, I was his ward. After I became of age, I stayed on with him, you might say, as a secretary. I see. Won't you sit down? No, thank you. Now, we'll try not to take up too much of your time, Miss Braden. We realize how you must feel. Yes. Just a few questions, and then we'll leave. I'll tell you anything I can, Mr. Hardy. The doctor's laboratory is on the premises here, is it? Yes, at the, at the rear of the house. Mm -hmm. And his bedroom was right next to it. My room is upstairs. Does anyone else live in this house, Miss Braden? Well, we have a housekeeper, but she doesn't sleep in. Then there was only you and Dr. Hilton. There... Used to be my brother Charles. He was the newspaper correspondent who disappeared in Eastern Europe two years ago. Yes, Miss Braden. As we know about your brother, his case is still an open matter in our files. 
first Charles. And now, Dr. Hilton. We may yet locate your brother, Miss Brady. Oh, I've given up hope. Dr. Hilton and I both knew why Charles disappeared. Because the country in which he was working didn't like the truth. And Charles told the truth in his dispatch. Oh, we'll be just a moment more. It, it's quite all right. I don't mind if I can be of any help. Well, who knew about Dr. Hilton's plan to go to Washington? I did. Besides yourself? The housekeeper, perhaps? Oh, I don't believe so, Mr. Harding. Dr. Hilton cautioned me to mention it to no one. I see. Well, that's about all, Miss Braden. If there's anything else I can oh, do, no, anything... no, not at the moment. But if you do think of anything that might help us, you can reach me at the counter-spy field office in Meadville. Call me any time, day or night. Do you think you'll be able to find the man who... I don't know, Miss Braden, but we're certainly going to try very hard. Very hard. <laughs> You're back sooner Mr. than I... Mr. Sibley. Garouk, what, ha what happened? Your head is bleeding. That animal. That animal, Steve. Come on, man, speak. What happened? He, he lunged at me before I could fire. What? He was desperate. You know how a man who is going to die sometimes becomes... You let him get away. I tried to stop him. I, I held on to him. Garouk, a small man... He, he is such a large animal. He kicked me on oh, my head. He got away. He kicked Grok. Kicked me in my head. Now the counter spies will have him in no time. Oh, help me, Mr. Sibley. Oh, the pain in my head. Help me. And five minutes after they have him, he'll have told them everything. Oh, Grok, you fool. It was going to be an exquisite pleasure for you. Grok had the brains, but, but he had the instinct and speed of an animal. You bungled, ruined everything. Oh, my head. Oh, Mr. Sibley, do something for Grok. Do something to stop the pain in his head. Oh. All right, Grok. I'll help stop the pain in your head. Oh, you are a merciful man, Mr. Sibley. But I'll stop the pain in you forever. You are listening to the case of the stolen secret on Counter Spy. That new private detective, Charlie Wilde, solves another mystery in just a short while over most of these NBC stations. And later today, there's another broadcast of your Sunday evening extravaganza, The Big Show. Your stars tonight will be Groucho Marx, Edzio Pinza, Jane Powell, Fanny Bryce, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Frank Lovejoy, Meredith Wilson, and many, many more. Supervising the hour-and-a-half Big Show will be MC Tallulah Bankhead. And incidentally, when unpredictable Tallulah meets unconventional Groucho, look out. It's The Big Show every Sunday on NBC. Now... Back to Counter Spy. That's the information, Carter. Radio to all patrols. Have them notify me here at the Meadville Field Office. So his name is Steve Meeker, eh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Harding? Meeker. He's got a record a half mile long. If he's still in the area of our operation, he's a gone duck. That idea of yours sending the diner owner down to Washington for identification paid off. Well, we can't be too sure yet, Peters, but it certainly saved us some time. Wait a minute. Harding speaking. I want to talk to you, Harding. Who's this? Steve Meeker. You're Steve Meeker, you say? That's right. Meeker, Dave? Get on the extension. I give up. I'm listening. I heard my name on the radio just now. I'm cut off, I know it. I can't move two feet without there's a cop right there. All right, Meeker, if you're ready to give up, all you have to do is walk into the field office here. I'll call my men off. Oh, it ain't your men. There's someone else in Meadville I'm worried about. Who? You gonna come for me? Where are you? Over in Centerdale. Who's after you, Meeker? Nothing doing. I don't spill that until I know it's gonna do me some good. All right. Where exactly are you? In a drugstore. Now, listen to me. Get out of that store. The one you're worried about may be there instead of Meadville. 
Go to the address I'm going to give you and tell whoever's there that I sent you, and I'll be along to pick you up. You'll be safe there. Okay. 14 Crown Street. Got that? Yeah, 14 Crown. Wait there for me. I'm starting for Centerdale now. <laughs> Yes? Uh, this is 14 Crown, ain't it? Yes, it is. Well, then I got the right place. Whom do you wish to see? Uh, I don't know the name. Oh, I'm sure you must have the wrong information. Oh, no, no. This is where David Harding sent me. Mr. Harding? Yeah. Yeah, he said I should wait here for him. He said if I gave you his name, you'd let me in. Uh, then come in. You can wait for Mr. Harding in the living room. I'm Lucy Braden, Mr... My name doesn't count. Didn't Mr. Harding say what time he'd be here? As soon as he can get over from Meadville. Uh, sit down, if you like. Thanks. Uh, mind if I smoke? Not at all. Uh, can I get you something? Well, what have you got? Maybe rye? I'm sorry, we have no whiskey in the house. Beer? No beer, either. But I, I have some soft drinks in the refrigerator. Soda pop, eh? Yes. Would you care for some? Well, okay. I wouldn't mind. I'll be right back. Uh, hey. Yes? Cut matches, I'm all out. You'll find a lighter on the desk. Thanks. Uh, they never work these lighters. Never the first time. We only have root beer. Oh, root beer's okay. In fact, it's perfect. I took the liberty of pouring your glass. Mm-hmm. You can take any liberty you like with me, honey. Any time. Uh, there's more if you want it. Nice and cold. I like drinks that are nice and cold. Would you please... Would I what? Uh, nothing. Are you sure Mr. Harding sent you here? Mm -hmm. He sent me. <laughs> he sure set up something nice and neat for me. What? What do you mean? Look, honey, I'm no friend of Harding. Then what are I'm you... I'm on the lamb. <laughs> Wait. Let me go, please. You came to me just now like that. Please, let me go. You're hurting me. I was going to do a dumb thing, but now i got a better idea. Yeah, great. What a setup. Please let me go, please. You're leaving this place now with me. What? That's right. You're getting me out of this jam, baby. You're my rain check. No cop in the world would take a pot shot while I got you right next to me. <laughs> and Harding set up the whole thing himself. We'll write him a letter of thanks when we get out of the country. You're crazy. Sure, like a fox. You can't get away. away. If you're wanted, they'll get you sooner or later. With you along, honey, nothing can... St oh. Nothing? Huh? Nothing, Steve? Oh, Mr. Sibley. I'm taking up where Garok left off. <laughs> Garok was right. You are an animal. A man dies much faster than... And that, Lucy, makes the final bridge we've burned behind us. You waited long enough to fire, Sibley. <laughs> Sorry, my dear. It all rather amused Don't me. Don't be insolent. Forgive me. Well, we owe a great deal of our good fortune to Harding, eh, Lucy? Yes, but you'd better not be here to thank him. Listen, that must be Harding now. It's too late for me to get out. Get in the back of the house. Hide in the kitchen closet. Well, they must have heard the shots. What are you going to tell Harding? Leave that to me. Give me your gun. Yeah. Now, hurry. Do what I told you. All right. Oh, Mr. Harding. It was terrible. What's happened, Miss Braden? Where's the man, I say? Come in, please. You, did, did you hear the shots? Shots? What shots are you talking about? There. There's the man you sent over there near the table. What happened? He tried to make me go with him. He said he was going to use me as a shield. 
I broke away from him, and there was a gun in the desk. I tried to hold him at bay. He came after me. Now, 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 take it easy, Miss Braden. You don't have to be too upset. He was a vicious killer. He murdered Dr. Hilton. He? He was the one? Yes. Oh, Mr. Harding, how could you send that man here to this house of all places? I'll let you think about my reason for that, Miss Braden, when you're in a cell in a good, strong jail. What? Until you come to trial for murder and espionage. What are you talking about? As the head of aspiring, Miss Braden, you should know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you don't know what you're saying. Now, if you'll just come along, we can talk it all over down at the field. Stand right where you are or I fire this gun. So I do know what I'm talking about. Unfortunately for you, you do. I'm interested in one thing especially. How can your sentiments be what they are in the face of what happened to your brother? Very simple. My brother is alive and well. He went to the place where he is now of his own free will. We both have the same political sentiments. Charles is waiting for me to join him. You'll never make it now. I never shot a woman, but I'd be glad to make you an exception unless you drop that gun. <laughs> all right, come on, you. You're joining the party. All right, all right. If you caught me so... Would you consider resisting arrest? No, what a shame. Where'd you find him, Peter? Lined up with a couple of dirty brooms in the kitchen closet. Lucy, what are we going to do now? Plead guilty as charged. First, Mr. Harding, you'll have to prove those charges. That won't be hard. This evening, my agents came across a dead man named Garok. Of course, Garok didn't talk, but the data we found in his photo lab did. I'll take these two along, Chief. Wait, uh, just a moment, Peters. I have something that may interest Miss Braden. I doubt it. Usually, Miss Braden, the counter-spies operate on a highly scientific basis, but every once in a while, we have to resort to our knowledge of criminal behavior to get results. You were much too innocent of too many things. You went out of your way to point out that you were the only one who knew Dr. Hilton was going to Washington. A fact you made no bones about, obviously, to establish how innocent you were. It was your behavior that got results in this case. Oh, no. It was the stupidity of my associates. Oh, no. The stupidity was essentially yours to think you could get away with treason. All right, now, Peter, you take them away. Tune in every week, same time, same station, to Counter Spy. Listen next week for the exciting case of the pseudo spuds. When an agricultural magician sowed tons of potatoes, he hoped to reap a half million dollars in cash. Instead, he reaped a harvest of sawdust that blew up in his face and launched your counter spies on a search for clues that covered thousands of miles. The full details will be revealed next week in Case of the Pseudo Spuds on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by Marks B. Loeb, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer. Counter Spy is produced by Phillips H. Lord. Charlie Wilde, and in a half hour, hear The Big Show on NBC.